What is up, my good people? Welcome to my second story breakdown for Black Myth Wukong. We'll be recapping the story and some of the more obscure things that go down in Chapter 2. Yellow Sand, Desolate Dusk. Chapter 2 was wild, so let's get into it. We kick off with this absolute rock star jamming away on his sunshine. I love that they kept the original Chinese translation and didn't try to redo the actual audio into English when playing the English translation. This man is so metal. Just out here casually without a head, giving us a little bit of a res and dropping the lay of the land in his song to start giving us a little perspective about the land we're about to explore. His jam, Yellow Wind Rises, translates loosely to this. Yellow Wind Ridge stretches for 800 miles. Outside the Tongate tiles, out of nowhere comes a rat infestation, creating a foul atmosphere leading to depopulation. No father, no ruler, no law. Evildoers went rampant with heavenly protection. Blessed was the great sage with Buddha's strength. The evil wind momentarily lowers their banner stand. To cut right to the chase, our headless bro over here is Bodhisattva Ling Ji, the warden of the Yellow Wind Sage. The Yellow Wind Sage capitalized on an opportunity to take Ling Ji's head, to use it as a vessel to channel one of the great sage's relics. This relic is the reason that we are here, and our target is the Yellow Wind Sage. Let's take a trip to the past, shall we? Kicking off with Yan Shou Chong, or Gord Grandpa, as some are calling him, we ran into him for the second time and he politely informs us that he calculated meeting up with us again. Cool story bro. My dude over here is a fortune teller and shares a short tale of the downfall of the dragon king of the Jing River, Jing He Long Wang. Gold Grandpa was known far and wide for his 100% accurate prophecies and the dragon king did not like this. He hatched a plot to try and forge an incorrect prophecy. He asked Gord Grandpa how much it would rain the next day. The prophecy was given and Jing He went back to his temple. He and his host laughed at the prediction as the Dragon King himself controlled the winds and the rain and could simply not make it rain to prove Gord Grandpa wrong. Just then, Jing He received a decree from the Jade Emperor to make it rain the next day at the exact time and by the exact amount that Gord Grandpa had predicted. Jing He tried to defy his destiny by slightly altering the time and amount of rain to make Gord Grandpa look like a fraud. The Dragon King begged for his life as Gord Grandpa revealed that he knew all along that he was the Dragon King and prophesied that he would die. The Jade Emperor, displeased that Jing He disobeyed him and tried to run from his fate, ordered that he be killed by a human. The Dragon King appealed to the human emperor, Tai Zhang, who was merciful and wished to forgive him. However, he was just a little bit too late. Jing He was beheaded by the human that the Jade Emperor had specified. A prime minister named Wei Zheng fell asleep at a preordained time, had his spirit leave his body, and decapitated Jing He while he was flying above the city. Wei Zheng had merely dreamed of the decapitation, and soon after, another minister had reported that a dragon head fell from the sky. This dragon would go on to file a lawsuit of wrongful death against the emperor, as Bodhisattva Guan Yin appeared at this point and saved his life after the decapitation. Some time later, Emperor Taizong would meet his end and find himself in the underworld. The Ten Kings would then determine that the Dragon King's death was not his fault and was simply preordained in the Book of Life and Death. Side note here, Sun Wukong had scratched his own name out of this book. My boy Wukong has no chill. Tying this whole story back to some of the ideas we're going to be building on in Chapter 2, Emperor Taizong is reincarnated and commissioned to hold a grand mass to help the souls of those who died a wrongful death to reincarnate. Would you believe that the monk, Tang Sanzong, was selected to be the high priest for this ceremony and was given a kasaya from Bodhisattva Guan Yin. We all know about this this particular Kasaya from chapter 1. The monk was then tasked to go to the west and retrieve the scriptures, thus necessitating their journey. So we've come full circle now. Gord Grandpa over here believes that even those who are immortal can't control their own fate. The river will flow and the wheel will turn for all beings. This particular interaction echoes that everyone is trapped within their own destinies and this speaks to a much broader theme that runs throughout the entire story of Black Myth Wukong. Let us now peek into the Kingdom of Sahali, a land where the sun sets each day into the Western Sea. We access this place by way of a memory that we are exposed to by Zhubaji, otherwise known as Pigsy. At the edge of heaven, the sun of true fire would create a deafening sizzle that sounded like flames plunging into water. It was so excruciating, 
that babies would die in their cots. The only way to counteract the harshness of the sun was to beat the drum known as the drum of the setting sun. This big ass drum was a gift from Buddha to the people. Everyone was so grateful, they started creating golden Buddha statues and the land became known as the land of gold. The king of Sahali grew jealous of the fact that people were choosing Buddha over him. So he tore down the temples, the statues, banished all the monks and changed the name of the land to the kingdom of flowing sand. Now that the land had turned away from Buddha, beating the drum caused the giant beetle known as Fuban to appear and terrorize the kingdom. Ling Ji found their lack of faith disturbing and empowered said beetle to plague the desert in retribution. The king thus permitted Buddhism in the kingdom once more fearing that the beetle was a curse. Now, some time ago, there was a yellow-furred rat who stole oil from Buddha's lamp on Spirit Mountain. Buddha, not wanting to kill him, tasked Bodhisattva Lingji with detaining him. Much like the black bear was disciplined by Guan Yin, trapped into servitude against their will. Hugh, the yellow-furred rat's entrance into the story. He had run away from Spirit Mountain and Having a righteous heart, wanted to help the people of the Kingdom of Flowing Sand. He also wished to harness the beetle's power for his own ends. Playing through this secret section of Chapter 2, which took place in the past, you would see that the yellow-furred rat managed to defeat the beetle and was given the title of Royal Sage. The Royal Sage would then petition the king to issue the Rodent Reverence Edict, which would declare that rats were celestial beings protected by law. At the time, this was a human kingdom, and the yellow-furred rat's presence was a source of tension among the people, particularly the first and third prince. Following the passing of this edict, several rat guai would start migrating into the region. One day, out of nowhere, all the humans that resided in the kingdom turned into rats, including the king and the first two princes. The third prince had left the land as he was opposed to the king's decision to abandon Buddhist practices, thus was not affected by this change and did not become a rat. This was indeed a curse administered by Ling Ji, following the king's reliance on the royal sage rather than on Buddha. The royal sage skips town at this point and retreats to Yellow Wind Ridge. It's worth noting that all the rat wise that you encountered during the chapter were once human, and Zhubaji even passes a comment that the rats taste like man flesh. The king had three sons, three princes known by different virtues. The first prince, the warrior, known for his prowess on the battlefield. The second prince, devoted but of simple mind. The third prince, the king's most trusted advisor and devoted to Buddhism. Also, he doesn't feature in this chapter, so we're going to skip over him completely. The first prince was not a fan of the royal sage. He had daddy issues and resented the preference shown by the king towards the royal sage over his own sons. The prince tried to get the royal sage ousted, but the king wasn't having it. One day, on the royal sage's birthday, the king was honoring him with prayer and incense, when the first prince suddenly grew angry and overturned the incense table. This earned the bro a one-way trip to the slammer. The prince also shares an account of that fateful day when he was walking in the streets and noticed that all the humans were gone. Instead, all the guards and officials were now rats in robes. And who more fitting than the one and only royal sage happened to come by with a mirror to show the prince his own reflection. Needless to say, the prince lost his business and went mad, leading to him not being too bothered about chowing down on dear old dad in chapter 2. The second prince now was a bit of a brute. Think Master Blaster, but without the master. He loved his dad and wouldn't split from his side. So I suppose even if he was a little dull, he was still dedicated. Now the Yellow Rat, having retreated to Yellow Wind Ridge, remained a disciple of Bodhisattva Lingji and started being known as the Yellow Wind Great King. During his escapades, he encountered another Yao Guai causing trouble named Shigandang. Shigandang is a big stone bro who brandishes several Buddha heads on his body. These Buddha heads appeared out of the blue one day and when tested they were found to be made of organic materials like muscles and tissue. The stone guai discovered that these statues could be crushed up and would absorb into the flesh to grow a new Buddha head on the stone guai's body. The guai proceeded to repeat this process several times and would eventually become the evil creature known as Shigandang. Shigandang would then start consuming living beings to cultivate itself.
the other stone guys wished to remove Shigandang from existence and asked the mother of stone for aid. She ultimately agreed and together they struck at Shigandang. The mother of stone's quartz was shattered and she fell to the ground defeated. However, our yellow bird rat would chance upon this battle and being determined to help the stone guys would fight alongside them to eventually defeat Shiganda. He was not killed though and could only be sealed away by using the same Buddha heads it had coveted so much. The yellow rat would then extract the powerful essence from Shigandang and bestow it onto the other stone guides in the hopes that they would use it to grow and look after the land. Our yellow haired friend then set up shop by erecting a temple and had a super cuddly tiger catch mortals for dinner. Now here we have our dear old tiger vanguard and he had a pretty gross technique where he would rip off his entire hide and use it as a decoy. In the original Journey to the West novel, Sun Wukong and the rest of the gang would come upon the tiger and engage in battle. He tricked them by throwing his pelt onto a rock, dispersing his true form into the wind, kidnapping the Tong monk and escaping without anyone even realizing. Wukong and co searched the mountains and finally found their master at the Yellow Wind Cave. The tiger vanguard grabs 50 Yagwais to attack Sun Wukong, but they are no match for him. And all the tiger vanguard can do is try and escape certain doom. Jubaji catches the tiger before he can escape and swiftly unalives him by slamming his rake into the tiger's head. Arriving now at the Yellow Wind Great King, the bro is not happy that the tiger vanguard has been killed and throws down with Sun Wukong. Without a clear winner emerging, Wukong summons 100 clones to fight the yellow rat, but they are defeated and Wukong is blinded when the rat falls upon the Samadhi wind. Not being able to fight any longer, he flees and he and Jubaji take refuge in a small farm cottage for the night. Wukong then proceeds to ask the farmers if there are any eye doctors around and he is told that they are in luck because these particular farmers have a special medicine that can cure specifically any wind inflicted eye injuries. Hmm, a little suspicious. Now the healed Wukong turns himself into a mosquito and goes over to his master in the Yellow Wind Cave. He tells the Tongue Monk that everything will be okay and he just needs to chill. They do however need to defeat the Yellow Wind King before they can actually rescue the Tong Monk. Wukong then happens to overhear the Yellow Rat saying that the only being that could defeat him is Bodhisattva Ling Ji. Ling Ji has the Wind Tamer Pro given to him by Buddha. This is the same item that we retrieve after defeating Fuban. He also has the Golden Long Star, which becomes craftable later on in the game. Wukong and Ling Ji now engage in battle with the rat once again. But before the rat can use his Samadhi Wind, Ling Ji throws the staff into the ground, summoning a fierce golden dragon, which absolutely wrecked our yellow furred rat and forced him to revert to his original rat form and flee from the mountains. However, some time later, the rat would make his return to the Yellow Wind Ridge. In the present day, during our search for this so-called Yellow Wind Sage, we come across two new tigers who are the offspring of the Yellow Rat's trusted tiger vanguard that Jubaji killed with his rake. First is the current tiger vanguard who was revered as a deity and had the crouching tiger temple built in his honor. Secondly, we have the mad tiger hidden in a well. Upon the Yellow Wind Sage's return, he was challenged by the two tigers, but defeated them both pretty quickly, with the younger tiger, now known as the Mad Tiger, being knocked unconscious during the battle. His older brother, who is now the current Tiger Vanguard, would swear fealty to the Yellow Wind Sage. When the younger brother, the Mad Tiger, awoke and heard what had happened, he fled down a well and started his descent into madness. The Mad Tiger harbors much hatred and blames the Yellow Wind Sage for the death of his father and the divide that was caused between him and his brother. The current Tiger Vanguard, however, takes out his own anger by consuming the rats that worship him and drinks pools of their blood. The Mad Tiger, however, would hide and bide his time with his brother's healing gourd as he descended further into madness. He would later form an alliance with a retired warrior who would eventually become his acolyte. This man settled in the village with his wife and they had a son. However, his wife's life was claimed and his son was made ill by the dreaded Samadhi winds, which happened to cause a deadly sickness in the village. The mad tiger had promised to heal his son with his brother's board. In exchange for the acolyte and his son, 
tricking people into jumping down the well so the mad tiger could eat them. The mad tiger, however, would grow fond of the boy over time as he would refer to him as Tiger God and play with him when he came to drink from the gourd. Eventually though, the mad tiger would gift the gourd to the boy. Now, the village people happened to realize that the tiger's acolyte was up to no good and they took it upon themselves to beat his son to death. He thus proceeded to kill everyone in the village and then just vanished. I would assume that the grief and trauma of the whole experience drove him to adopt the demon-like visage he has when we encounter him on the bridge. The mad tiger, wondering why the acolyte and his son had not come to visit in a while, would leave his well and walk through the village to search for them. What he found was a massacre and a small child-sized coffin which housed the boy with the tiger's gourd still around his neck. The tiger would carry the coffin back down the well and vow with every fiber of his being to destroy the yellow wind sage. Note how the destined one honors the boy while opening the chest in the well. This is apparently the only chest that opens with this particular animation in the entire game. We are brought now to our encounter with the yellow wind sage. We find him carrying the head of Bodhisattva Lingji and he is now a far grumpier and cynical rat compared to the way he was in the past. He opens up with a few lines that speak to the overarching themes of prejudice between the different beings that inhabit this world. This draws a likeness to how the heavenly beings view Sun Wukong. He is a Guai, but also an affront to heaven. He will never be accepted, even though he was given the title of the victorious fighting Buddha. He is a lower being and such things are just not allowed. However, Wukong rages against this machine. As we saw in the game's opening, Yao Guai will always be seen as inferior beings. Upon defeating the Yellow Wind Sage, Lingji puts himself back together and talks about one of the great sages' six relics that the Yellow Wind Sage chanced upon. However, that isn't quite true. The Yellow Wind Sage did not just chance upon the relic. And we'll address that specific topic a little later on in the game. Lingji speaks half-truths to us throughout the entire chapter to implicate others and keep his own hands clean. Lingji tells us then that the rat deceived him and took his head to harness the power of the relic. The yellow rat, however, was not a powerful enough being to withstand the might of the relic. And thus, it corrupted him, even with the head of Lingji in his possession. But how, I ask, was the yellow rat able to take his master's head? How was he able to defeat a bodhisattva? How, when he wasn't even able to withstand the might of the relic, was he able to behead his master? Perhaps Lingjie allowed this event to transpire. Much like the other events in the story that are a consequence of fate and have been preordained, these things don't just happen by chance. Calling a spade a spade here, the celestial beings are all pretty corrupt and they have their own twisted view of karmic justice. Reading through some of Ling Ji's journal entries, we see that the events that transpired across the past few hundred years changed him from the benevolent, enlightened being to one with more mortal characteristics, such as anger and lust. Such it was that he inflicted curses upon the people of Sahali and then the land of gold. These actions were more reactions to his feelings of joy or sorrow. When the people worshipped Buddha, there was peace and harmony. But when they relied on the yellow rat Guai, Lingji grew upset and retaliated. In the end, even the narrator hints that bodhisattvas can fall when their feelings get in the way. Such it was that even the beetle Fuban might have been Lingji's own mount. And once Fuban was defeated, Lingji retaliated once again by turning all the people into rats. The celestial beings seek control above all things, and the hierarchy of beings will be maintained at all costs. This is also reflected in the closing animation, where we see a man rescuing an injured wolf who turned out to be a woman who he falls in love with, and together they have children. The woman, however, one day reverts back to her guai state and gives into her inherent nature and consumes their son. It appears though after the fact that this was all a nightmare, as we see the man awakes to look over and see the wolf is still asleep in the house. He is then shown to have killed the wolf and proceeds to wear her pelt as a scarf. The idea had been seeded in the man's heart that this guai must be evil, purely just because she is a guai and that is the man's view on the matter. This reflects 
two sides of a coin to every given being. The duality of man, as it were. The contrasting aspects within any Buddha, Bodhisattva, human or Gwai. How one's nature might sway in the wind. Ultimately, what Wukong was trying to do was break the preconceived ideas of one's inherent nature. Gwais are not inferior just because they are Gwais. And humans are no better just because they were born human. The celestial beings value hierarchy and perfection over equality and unity. The more you strive for perfection, the more you are likely to lose, as perfection is an unattainable ideal. Please drop a comment below and let me know what you thought of this story breakdown. If you floated over here via the river of YouTube, please be kind and subscribe. I'll be continuing on with my Let's Play series as we kick off Chapter 3, White Snow, Ice Cold. Looking for more videos to sink your teeth into? Why not try the one on screen now? I'll catch you, my beautiful humans, in the next one.